Myrrh. Myrrh is a resin that bleeds out of a wounded tree, which then the harvester scrapes off and he allows it to crystallize and then he grinds it down into many different forms, sometimes a powder, sometimes a liquid, sometimes more of a resin substance. But when he does, there is a a beautiful yet strong scent that comes from myrrh. You probably know it best as one of the gifts that was presented to the infant Jesus by the Magi back in Matthew chapter two. Those visitors from the east, they brought to him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And if you can recall some kind of Christmas study that I'm sure you've heard many Christmas sermons before that detailed why they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, you would remember that myrrh was a strange thing to bring to a baby shower. Very strange thing. It was primarily used in preparing bodies for burial. To mask the decay, the body would have been rubbed with myrrh. The linen which wound around the body would have been dipped in myrrh, causing the fabric to not only harden or solidify, but also smell more acceptable by the time the body was buried. And that is what these guys brought to the baby shower. Myrrh was also used in religious observances from people of all kinds of faith. It was lit as an incense. The smoke would then waft through the air of the temple that was being worshipped in, and it would affect everyone that smelled it, and it would cause a a sight-augmenting haze in the building. In fact, if you were to read some faiths that were not Christian or were not Judaistic. They, they lit this incense because it smoked so much and you couldn't see everything going on. And so it caused the whole atmosphere of that place where this God was being worshipped to completely and totally change. It was strong and, and that smoke, that scent, it was described as being thick where you could feel it. Well, the book of Esther And some of Solomon's writings, they seem to depict myrrh as a beauty product. Esther was dipped in myrrh every day for six months before she was allowed to see King Xerxes. That's that's crazy. That goes way past your spa treatments. For six months dipped in myrrh before she was even able to meet the guy that she was having the beauty pageant for, Xerxes. And... A woman to which Solomon refers often, she anoints her bed with myrrh. He says that in the book of Proverbs, and he also mentions it in the Song of Solomon. However, the two women are vastly different. One his wife, one not a good woman. Myrrh was expensive, and pure myrrh still is. By the way, say pure myrrh 12 times fast. You can't do it. So it was used a lot among tradesmen. Without a standard of money, they would trade myrrh. And that's most likely why this port city of Smyrna got its name. Smyrna means myrrh in Greek. And if you can remember from the previous verses, Jesus in a vision to John is having John write certain letters to seven ancient churches that are found in modern day Turkey. And Smyrna is the second of those churches. 50 miles north from the recipients of the first letter, Ephesus, that we looked at last week, Smyrna is the next huge trade town. So it was natural as Christianity spread all across Asia for new converts to plant a church in this bustling metropolis. Sadly, we don't have much of a biblical record in regards to the inception of this church. However, most people believe that it falls into the Acts 19.10 passage where Luke records that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord, heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. So here in this ancient Greek metropolis boasting hundreds of thousands renowned as the land of Homer was where he was born. It was most likely where he penned the Iliad and the Odyssey. It's here that the truth of the gospel takes root and a church begins to grow. 
It doesn't grow quietly nor underground. In fact, the Christians at Smyrna, they have grown so, grown so strong in number that they have attracted the ire, the anger of a group of very zealous Jews. They're bent on discrediting this new Jesus sect at any cost. They cannot stand that the Galilean that was crucified decades ago in Jerusalem would have a group of devoted worshipers all the way over a thousand miles away in Smyrna. They can't stand it. They thought they had stomped him out. So the slander begins. And they kind of bullseye, focus in, crosshairs on this Christian community in Smyrna. Because these Christians call each other brother and sister and they show such devoted love for each other, early history tells us that the church was often accused of committing incest, even though it was a baseless claim. Since they called themselves brother and sister and they loved each other so well, they must be doing something in that church. Because they practiced the Lord's Supper, which sounds completely and totally abhorrent to an unbeliever, eating the body of Christ, drinking his blood, albeit symbolically, the early believers were then accused of cannibalism. Every week they meet and they eat the body and they drink the blood. They're cannibals, was the slander being spread. Because God worked amazing miracles through Paul and several other Christ followers in that region. Just read Acts 19 for more detail. The Jews, the Jews accused them essentially of working black magic, although they wouldn't use that term, conjuring healings and such through demonic power. Which, if you recall, that was exactly what they said of Jesus. That he did these healings of Beelzebub, of Satan. The Jews knew none of this was actually true, but they spread it all the same to a disastrous effect. That's why Jesus writes what he does of them in verse 9. He says to the church, I know your works, your tribulation, and your poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy or slander of those who say they are Jews and are not. They are of a synagogue of Satan. As a direct result of such slander, Christians in Smyrna, they lost their jobs. They were brought before city magistrates on trumped up charges. They were imprisoned because there really was no way to discredit any of the accusations. I mean, honestly, in a court of law, how can you prove to an unbeliever that the miraculous healing that happened after you and several other brothers prayed for a person when he got healed, how can you prove that that was true Christ-given power and not demonic power? And so they found these baseless, unprovable things to bring them up on. And that's why Jesus calls these professing Jews, these that are accusing the Christians falsely, he, calls, he says that they are not true Jews because they are not acting anything like their honorable ancestor Abraham. Jesus goes so far as to call them the synagogue of Satan. Hmm, that's harsh. That's a cutting accusation, but it doesn't seem to stop the tribulation of the church. So many Christians in Smyrna, they had criminal records, and by extension, they were very poor, very poor. The first century Jewish mind, or to the first century Jewish mind, all the church was, was just an amalgamation of slaves, lunatics, and weak-minded women. That's all they saw. Neither had a place of honor in their society. They could not understand why this group, so strange 
incestuous, cannibalistic, workers of strange magic. Why would this group continue to grow so rapidly? But there's a small hint in verse 9 in a phrase where Jesus says to them, I know your poverty. What's that next phrase? But you are rich. It doesn't matter what people take from you on this earth, whether possessions or position, you are rich in God. While others in Smyrna had heaped up treasures on earth, the Smyrnaean believers invested in heavenly riches where moths and rust do not corrupt, nor thieves can break in to steal. And while that may seem like Christianese and too Sunday school of an answer to many of us who are living and prospering in the Bible Belt now in the 21st century America, this sentiment is just another of the right side up way of thinking that Jesus taught. That though you are poor, you are rich. Why labor all your days and nights for stuff that has an expiration date? Why? Why endlessly toil for stuff that can be taken away quicker than a car wreck? This stuff, this power trip of owning more, it is nowhere close to the life of the Beatitudes that Jesus taught where the peacemakers and the meek and the poor in spirit and the merciful will be rewarded in ways which we cannot even imagine. So they are desperately poor, but man are they rich. And that's why they're growing. Jesus says to them, I know your works, I know your tribulation, I know your poverty, I, but you're rich. I know all these things, and I wonder if Jesus, if we could flip it on its head, and if Jesus would look into our hearts and our lives today and say, I see your position, I see your affluence, I see your security, but you are poor. He looks at Smyrna, and he says, I see all the things that are going wrong on the outside, but I also see the depths of richness in your life. And I wonder if he'd look at the American church today and say, I see all of your posterity, your position, your affluence, your security. I see it all, but you are so poverty stricken. So then Jesus gets to the meat of the message he knows their tribulations. He sees their trials. He hears all the slander coming from the jealous Jews. So what are they going to do about it? Or what are you going to do about it, Jesus? How are you going to come in and stop all of this? Well, to this kind of unsaid question, Jesus says in verse 10, I see, I know, I, I, I'm looking at all these things, this poverty, and then he says, do not fear. Good. Thank you, Jesus. You're going to step in and you're going to stop all these things. Do not fear. Yes, Lord. Jesus, take the wheel. Come on in. Change everything that's going wrong in my life. Anytime you want to stop it, you can jump right in here and you can help. Do not fear. No, that's not what happens. He says, do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. To the church in Smyrna, Jesus says, it's bad. And while they were hoping there would be a but, there's not. It's bad. And it's going to get a lot worse. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer while suffering. I mean, can you imagine receiving this letter from the Apostle John? I mean, let's just for a moment, let's picture it. Let's travel the 6,000 miles to this big city on the edge of the Aegean Sea. Let's go back two millennia. 
And let's just pretend for just a moment that we are the church in Smyrna. We are gathered together on the Lord's Day, and our pastor has just announced that we have mail. That John, one of Jesus' closest friends, had written to us, our church. He's given us a letter. And as they begin to read the letter, they see, oh, this letter isn't really from John. This letter is actually from Jesus given to John in a dream. Jesus is going to talk to us. So we all get excited. And the pastor, he unrolls the scroll. He reads the introduction. We feel affirmed, seen, noticed. Finally, not only does just John know about our afflictions, our persecution, but Jesus does. Jesus, sitting up in glory at the right hand of the Father, he sees us, he knows us. Finally, we can get a break. Finally, we can catch our breath from all of the suffering. He knows what's going on. Finally, Jesus, the cavalry is on its way. And then our pastor reads verse 10. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. And I'm positive that there's somebody who's like in the back and it says, whoa, wait, wait, did you read that wrong? About to suffer? Don't you mean don't fear the things that you are suffering? What's this about stuff? You mean there's more? Are you kidding me? Not only will the rumor mill start up again about each and every one of them, but now Rome is going to get involved. This won't just be some small, select, local group of persecutions. The big government is going to come in and start controlling the problem. The careless and the casual slander that the Jews had begun, it has now reached the ears of more than just regional officials. They've heard about this supposed dark magic, this accusation of cannibalism, this rank rumor of incestuous relationships, and not this stuff cannot just be swept under the rug as just another crazy religion out on the outskirts of Roman Empire. No, this stuff is going on under our noses, and so Rome thinks we've got to put a stop to this. But really, the straw that really broke Rome's back is the Christian's response to worshiping Caesar. Everything else to this point had just been slander and had been false accusation, blowing out of proportion some things that were not true. But now comes the issue of, will you worship Caesar or not? Most other religions, they were allowed to exist under Rome's authority so long as they paid homage to the embodiment of nationalistic pride and patriotic fervor. What they must do is they must sacrifice to Caesar as he were a god. And then they must obtain papers as proof that they are card-carrying members of this Caesar sect acknowledging him as their ultimate king. If you do that, you can believe whatever else you want to believe. Just kill the animal on the altar, you get your papers, and then you can do whatever you want to on Saturday or Sunday, it doesn't matter. Believe what you want to believe, say what you want to say, sing what you want to sing, read what you want to read, do whatever you want. But you got to sacrifice to Caesar. But this is a big problem. Christians won't do it. They'll pay their taxes. They'll obey Rome's laws as much as they are able. But they cannot sacrifice to Caesar. If they did, that would be tantamount to saying that Jesus' death on the cross wasn't good enough. If we're going to reinstate sacrificial laws and now it's to Caesar, 
you're pretty much spitting in the face of Christ on the cross. And so the believers, they won't do it. And so like the Hebrew boys in the book of Daniel, the Christians in Smyrna, they would not bend and they would not bow, but unlike them, they would burn. My word, would they burn. Jesus says that the devil is about to throw some of you in prison and that you will tr suffer tribulation 10 days. I think it's obvious that Jesus is using poetic language here and he's not saying that Satan himself will actually take on physical form, bind them, throw them in prison, nor that it will only be for an actual week and a half. In fact, history proves that it would be for much longer than just a mere 240 hours. The instrument of the devil, the tools of Satan, they are going to imprison them and they are going to make them suffer for a specific amount of time. It is very possible that there was an intense persecution for 10 literal days, but the earliest commentators of this passage, they seem to think that this denotes a season of life, that for a season of life, you will be persecuted. And what Jesus is trying to do in this letter is call them to join the ranks of the martyred. What does martyr mean? Mean. We know what a martyr is, but what does the word martyr mean? It means witness. And what more genuine way to prove to the neighboring slanderers around you that you really are a witness to the resurrection of Christ and his deity than by being willing to lay down your own life? Jesus is saying, prepare to be killed all the day long. The Bible records three named Christian martyrs. Let's hold off on the prophets in the Old Testament and even John the Baptist. While they look to and towards the Christ, there's really only three Christian martyrs named Stephen, James, and a man by the name of Antipas. There are many others, but these are the only named ones. And the detail of their stories of suffering, they decline one after the other. So what I mean by that is we know a lot about Stephen. We know a little about James. We know virtually nothing about Antipas. The most we know about is Stephen, who was one of the first deacons the Bible records in Acts chapter 6 and 7 that the Pharisaical leaders, emboldened by the death of Jesus, they took Stephen out of the city gates and they stoned him after he had preached an entire sermon, basically canvassing Bible cover to cover, starting in Genesis, ending with Jesus, his resurrection, and his ascension. And just before Stephen dies... He says two things of note. Number one, he says, I see the heavens opened up and Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. As I've told you before, I think this is Jesus giving him a standing ovation saying, welcome home, Stephen. I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. And the second thing of note that Stephen says, aside from his masterful sermon, his dying words are the most Christ-like things that he could have ever said. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. What a witness. James, the brother of John, was then in Acts 12, almost as a footnote right after this story and, and several other imprisonments. <coughs> it 
James is then killed by a puppet ruler by the name of Herod. And the Bible only says, with the sword. We assume that that's talking about capital punishment and not a crime of passion against James. That he was brought up on charges by Herod and killed. Of Antipas, as I said earlier, we know very little other than what Jesus says of him in Revelation chapter 2, verse 13, that he was Christ's martyr or Christ's witness, and he was murdered as a member of the neighboring Pergamos church. It's possible, more than likely, that the church in Smyrna had heard about Antipas's martyrdom. But history is replete of many more who have paid the ultimate sacrifice and laid down their own life for a witness of the resurrection of Christ. Hebrews 11, it gives us the best overall description of the many who died for their faith. It is the perfect mix of poetry and actual history. The author writes, others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. This is what the people of God have had to suffer. And Smyrna, this is what you are about to suffer. I see your tribulation. Do not fear what is about to happen. In fact, one of Smyrna's own would suffer martyrdom. It's an extra biblical account, but there's a, a man by the name of Polycarp. He just so happened to be the very student of John. Well, there's a lot of legend and lore that surrounds him. These are some of the historical facts. Around AD 156, Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, very old, was arrested during a Roman feast day. He was brought into the local stadium for questioning, really, public execution because not, uh, I mean, everybody knew what was about to go down. Christians were being slaughtered as atheists because they denied the godship of Caesar. So it's ironic that the Christians who believe in the one true God, they're being called atheists because they won't acknowledge the deity of Caesar. One of the officials, he demands of Polycarp, as was the norm with these questionings. He says, swear by the genius of Caesar, repent, say, away with these, with these atheists. But all Polycarp did was stare at him, history tells us. And finally, turning the phrase on its Roman head, Polycarp merely answered, away with these atheists. Speaking of the Romans. History records that his questioner then begged the old man, and he says, swear and I will release thee, curse the Christ. And Polycarp, hearing the demand, spoke his most famous line. He said, 80 and six years have I served him, and he hath done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Way to go, Polycarp. When he was threatened with wild beasts to attack him, Polycarp is said to have answered, Send for them, 
For repentance from better to worse is not a change permitted to us, but to change from cruelty to righteousness is a noble thing. When he was taunted with fire, Polycarp answered, Thou threatenest the fire that burns for an hour and in a little while is quenched, for thou knowest not of the fire of the judgment to come and the fire of the eternal punishment reserved for the ungodly. But why delayest thou? Bring what thou wilt. And there, Polycarp was burnt at the stake refusing to be nailed to it or even tied to it because he would willingly die for a savior. They tried to bind him and he said, you won't need those. Listen to a couple others from around this time period. In AD 108, Ignatius of Antioch was given audience with the emperor Trajan and thinking that Ignatius was going to recant Trajan was infuriated when Ignatius actually took the opportunity to preach the gospel to him. And so angered Trajan that he ordered Ignatius to be whipped mercilessly. Afterward, Ignatius' hands were doused in a flammable liquid and then lit on fire. He was then wrapped in paper that was dipped in wax, and he was lit on fire while being prodded with hot pinchers. He was still alive, although barely, and so the rest of his body was thrown to wild animals. In AD 202, sometime after the fact, Emperor Severus outlawed Christian conversion, but one noblewoman, a new mother, Perpetua, 22 years old, was already preparing to be baptized, having committed her life to Christ. And when she continued in her walk with Jesus, she was imprisoned and ultimately thrown into the Colosseum. There, she sang a hymn until she was trampled by a wild bull and ultimately stabbed by a gladiator, singing a hymn. Whole books have been written about the martyrs and a healthy Christian will read them and understand their value. These were our brothers and sisters that we will spend eternity with. (laughs) And we will get to hear their stories around the throne. But these stories are not consigned to only an era of barbaric history in some Colosseum. In fact, most historians claim that the 20th century that most of us were born into, experienced more Christian martyrdom than the other 19 centuries combined. In the 2000s, 1.6 million Christian believers were killed. In the 2010s, thankfully, that number went down. However, it was still an alarming 800,000 or so. If that number holds true in the 2020s, that means that 80 Christians, 80, excuse me, 80,000 Christians will die every year. And so for those of us who are doing the math, that means that since we've been at church this morning, starting at Sunday school at nine o'clock when I know you were here, up till now, 18 of our brothers and sisters have been martyred for their faith this morning. They had a very different church service from yours and mine. The fact that we don't know anyone personally who has been murdered for being a Christian is astounding. And it's a testament to the religious liberties that we still have in America. But do not be so foolish as to think that that will always be the case. I certainly don't mean to pull the old youth group trick of scaring you into sincere faith, of saying if somebody were to put a gun to your head, would you claim Jesus? That is old and tiresome and trite. Because all of us, every single one of us would say, absolutely, I would definitely do it. And yet, 
we can't even suffer a little persecution on the job. Seeing the events in our world and knowing how tenuous the best of governments seem to be in this era, I think we need to listen to what Jesus tells the church in Smyrna. He gives them two short directives. In just these few verses, there's two verbs. The first is, do not fear. The second is, be faithful. Do not fear. Be faithful. Stop for a moment and be cynical with me and ask, how in the world could Jesus, knowing what he knows, seeing what he sees, how in the world could Jesus tell them to not fear? We get scared when an election goes different from what we would like. They are being killed all the day long, and it's about to get worse. So how could Jesus tell them, do not fear? Well, if you were to read the text, it is speckled with hints. Just look at the introduction again. We've almost skipped over it by just merely reading it in verse 8. And to the angel, to the messenger, to the pastor of the church of Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. <laughs> On the side of his copy of scripture in Revelation 2.8, beside this title of Jesus, is claimed who was dead and came to life. There was a 16th century pastor reformer named Justus Minius, and he scratched to the side. He who came into the trial of death, by death, put death to death. <laughs> he who came into the trial of death, by death, put death to death. How could Jesus tell them to not fear? Because he had already been there, done that, and got the resurrected body to prove it. He's not poking fun at them. He's not saying, oh, it's no big deal. What he's doing is he's quoting the 23rd Psalm to them. He's saying, yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, for I am with you. He's experienced death. But he also sees them and where they are, and he knows where they're going. And look at verse 9 and how Jesus says, I know. He says, I know, twice. I know your works. I know your tribulations. I know your poverty. And I know the slander that others are speaking of you. So in short, whenever people face bad times, tribulation, persecution, they do one of two things. They question God's goodness or they question God's greatness. Something bad happens in your life and you automatically go to, if God were good, he'd put a stop to this. Since he has not, he must not be good. Or you'd go the other route and you'd say, since God knows what's going on. He sees me in my trouble, and he does not stop this trial. That must mean that he is not great, and he cannot do anything about it. Christian, hear me. He is both good and great. And in this verse, Jesus is putting both questions to rest. He is powerful enough to give a new body, and he is good enough to see us in our hurting and to empathize with us. So do not fear. Do not be afraid. 
Think of the many times when talking about the news, when flipping through the channels, what do we say? I'm guilty of it too. I'm scared for my children. Grandparents, great-grandparents, I'm scared for my granddaughter. I'm scared for my great-grandson. They're living in a world that I, I'd never even imagine. And I understand that. But to us, Jesus is saying, do not be afraid. He sees the trial. He knows what's coming even more because he's been there and he's resurrected. He who came into the trial of death by death put death to death. And so we can say with Paul, where is your sting? O oh, grave, where is your victory? His last directive is be faithful. The very last sentence of verse 10, it's a longer verse. He says, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus is not promising a crown of reward as in other places throughout the Bible. He does that, but not here. Here, in the original language, the crown is secondary. The focus isn't on a crown. It's not actually even referencing the Olympic wreath or the Isthmian crown that racers would get if they won in the ancient games. Here, the life is the reward, not the crown. And what he says in essence is, you be faithful even unto death and I will give you life. Real life. So much better than the tribulations and the poverties and the slanderings of this life. I'll give it to you by heaps and bounds. He goes on and he explains that this life that Jesus gives is so powerful that it can't even be threatened by the fires of hell, this second death, the, this eternity apart from Christ. This life is a promised life lived by his side. You be faithful and you get me. I have no idea what the next 10 years will look like in America. No idea. I'm not a doom and gloom prophet. For those of you who know my preaching, you know that's very out of the ordinary. I will say 10 years ago, I would not have thought that we are where we are. And the danger for the church, whenever the threat of persecution comes, is to circle the wagons and hide. Can we just hear the words of the ancient church father, Polycarp, once more? Eighty and six years have I served him. It doesn't ring as true if I were to put my own experience into his. 30 and four years have I served him. This man has been around, he has seen it all. 80 and six years I have served him and he hath done me 
no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king who saved me? Smyrna, it means myrrh. Myrrh only gives off its scent when the tree is pierced, when the substance is hardened, and then it's crushed. And so he's saying to the church of Myrrh, what is about to happen is going to be the best thing for your community. Because they are going to see what real Christianity looks like when you are crushed. Your witness is seen, maybe even smelt, by those around you and those moments when you are most severely crushed. So do not fear and be faithful.